There is a fifth dimension. A dimension of sound. Damn it, Frank, we tell him to be quiet. I spill my hot cup of Uranus again. A dimension of sight. Hey, Arch, I'm gonna sock you in the puss. A dimension of mind. Nan Adams, is that you? Ah! Ah! Next stop, the Twilight Zone. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Fifth Dimension of Twilight Zone podcast. I am, of course, your host, Nick, and we're here to talk the uh, Rod Sterling famous (laughs) podcast or famous TV show, whatever you want to call it. We're going to talk about it because we love the Twilight Zone. Uh, We're here to talk a new episode, as we usually do. Uh, We are in our 91st episode, and uh, yeah, this is an episode that has a lot of history behind it. It has a lot of uh, things that are, what's that word called? I forgot what that word is called when homages or it has kind of like it, it, it has spawned, kind of, it's Caligula. a lot. <laughs> it's Caligula. Yes, it has turned into Caligula. No, it's um it's an episode it's spawned, that it's um, spawned a lot of shit. Yeah, yeah. It's done it's been in like a Simpsons Everything. episode that was a spinoff, and it also was a uh uh like a uh kind of homage to what would end up being poltergeist. It's one of those types of things. So uh before we actually begin, we are on audio feeds like Anchor, SoundCloud, uh, iTunes, uh you know, Cups of Uranus, all that good stuff. Subscribe rate, you know how this works. You know, even if you give us like three stars, we love you anyways, you know that type of thing. But yeah, so with that said, uh Jake. And of course, Triff, we're back. Uh, how you guys doing? How was your, you know, I know Triff, you just did a live stream as this recording. Jacob, I know you were in the middle of collecting a thousand different video games and doing <laughs> another video, but how you guys doing? Yeah, I can't complain too much. I'm surprisingly buzzy for the amount of wine I've had today. Which is one glass, right? Oh, several. Several glasses. Oh, no. Elliot, that's me. Never mind. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, good times. But Jake is, uh, even though he's uh, in black and white right now, he is uh, rather green. He looks like the Joker if he grew up in Alabama or something like that. Am I green? <laughs> no, you're fine. You're, 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 you're green, but... I can't fucking tell. Your, your, <laughs> hair looks turn... like, your hair looks like it belongs on a 90s goth kid. Right. What? All he needs is some uh, green Jenko green jeans. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, but everything going good with you guys? Everything great? Yeah. Grand? Yeah. Great? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Freaking fectat. Freaking, freaking spectacular. <laughs> fantastical. Freaking, yeah, fantastical. I'm kicking. Excellent. <laughs> um, but with that said, uh, as we sometimes do, we have a guest to uh, help us out with this episode. Uh, first time guest, actually, which is awesome. This, of course, is somebody who uh, loves the Twilight Zone, who wanted to come on and talk about this episode. We'll get that in a second. Uh, but we, of course, have uh, Ryan, who is, of course, uh, an individual that runs a podcast called One Track Mind. And uh, Ryan, how you doing? Welcome to the, sh- the show, the craziness that is our fifth dimension. Oh, I am so happy to be here to talk about about one of my top 10 favorite episodes. Did you hear that, guys? Oh, could you hear that, Nick? In, Nick hates could, everything. Could, could be a change. I hate it all, please. <laughs> <laughs> could could be a change in the world. Uh, apparently, maybe, maybe. Uh, as long we'll as it's better than number about. 27. That's all <laughs> I ask for. <laughs> There you go. So, Ryan, I have to ask you, um, you apparently are a huge Twilight Zone fan. You said this, you probably put this in your top 10. Um, when it comes to the Twilight Zone, especially this this version of it uh, compared to the other ones, uh, where does the Twilight Zone stand for you as a TV show, as something that, you know, you love or don't, you know, like or, you know, and then like, what would be another episode that you really love, that type of thing? Uh, well, I think that I, I appreciate it beyond being a television series. I primarily, I primarily, I primordially, <laughs> primordially primarily that's the right word primarily, I like primordially better right I, I look at it as kind of a a uh, a subtext delivery system more than I do a television series yeah. I love anything that can get this political 1850s and 60s right up my alley and I just I absolutely adore the show uh my other favorite episodes uh well number one is the monsters are due on Maple Street which is just the greatest Amen, metaphor brother. that I think has ever been on television ever yeah it's um it, it's ironic because uh that street on uh, monsters doing maple street actually shows up in this episode which i thought was pretty great but yeah, i mean that's right yeah yeah but when it comes to you said it comes to like the subtext 
effects and stuff like that and the the concepts like what what makes the uh twilight zone special for instance like you know we've been talking about how it deals with like human emotion human psychology it deals with fears and stuff like that but what is like one of your favorite things about the twilight zone like like uh kind of in the concepts of what ross was doing and how he was portraying the the crowds and the the groups and you know society as a whole because it's very like ahead of its time for what it came out yeah I, what i love most about rod serling is that he was above all things a humanist he saw yeah. every he saw humankind as this elaborate patchwork quilt he did not see any uh, demarcations between people between cultures he saw everything as part of one giant continuum when there was a lot of hate in the world and a lot of distrust and a lot of paranoia and he anchored it with such grace and determination yeah we um we talked about a lot of times where rod Serling, you know he was in world war ii he fought over in the pacific and stuff like that and it's interesting to see how you know at the time of uh rod Serling kind of going through life and coming out of the war and having kids and his views and stuff like that and you can see it like in his post twilight zone years when he went on to like different talk shows he he's a guy that was really affected by a lot of stuff that seems to kind of you know be like even today brush under the rug by certain subjects or uh, subsets of the society and it, it's just it's really interesting and i don't know how you feel like about this but it's really interesting to see a guy just take a tv show take a series that could be very cheesy, very uh, slight. It could just be very haphazard. I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, a time when there was stuff like Bewitched and there was stuff like, you know, Mr. Ed and Adam's Family. And he was, you know, doing stuff like, I don't know, like you said, Monsters Do on Maple Street. Um, the one where they're getting ready to hang the um, the uh, the black man. It's like Color Me Night or something like that. And he was doing all these shows. And I'm just kind of curious to like, you know, when you see stuff like that, like, does that make it feel more special to you? Like, how do you kind of like wrap your head around that? No, absolutely. It does. Uh, what I love about Serling was that he saw the potential of science fiction, which is to say yeah. things that you cannot say out loud. But you, if you say this person is black, this person is Native American, this person is X or Y, you can only get so far. But if you say this person is a Martian, then you can get however far you want to go. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like, like I said, we've, in the 91 episodes that we've talked about, it's, some have been greater, some have been worse. And the one thing that makes the episodes that are great so great is just, they're they're very um relatable so you know one episode this episode we're going to talk about is very relatable you know it's about what would happen to parents if they lost their kid and how would they affect that i mean it goes into you know a very interesting twilight zone territory but it's it's a very fascinating thing and you know uh, same thing with you guys like you guys like feel the same thing with this kind of episode or do you think i mean i don't know how you guys feel i'm trying to find the easiest way to put that oh no all good <laughs> I, I think that anyone that even if you don't have kids i think you can look at this and go you can imagine how that how absolutely terrified the parents would be losing someone i mean because everyone's been a kid everyone's had those moments where they like lost their parents and you have that absolute moment of terror of, oh crap what's gonna happen now i'm in this place i don't know what to do you're 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 confronted with a thing that you've never been confronted with and everybody has those from time to time and it, it's it, it it hits on multiple levels yeah, I worry about losing one of my kids every day because I got so many of them. <laughs> There's always one of them I'm worried about losing. So, yeah, I get what they're going But through. only one of them. Not all. Just one of them. Hey, there's only one that I worry about losing. Yeah, okay. One. Yeah. Just want to make sure. Just, I, I think we're all on the same level here. We all have those kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I don't have yeah, personal yeah. kids, but I, I've babysit before. And if I lost one of those kids, I don't think I'd lose too much sleep. But, you know, they weren't the greatest kids. <laughs> if you're watching four kids and you get to the end of the night with three i think you're you know you're betting yeah, that's 75 percent, man <laughs> yeah that's that's more than 50 that's still fresh <laughs> you're still batting at least a d plus on the, on the tomato meter you're still fresh so i mean <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> i gotta ask you ryan have you seen uh before we get to the actual episode have you seen this like kind of the homages to this i'm pretty sure you've seen polder guys but have you seen that treehouse of horror episode that yes homer cubed this? one of the yeah, very yeah. best treehouse of horror segments ever the first time that cgi was ever used on a animated television series in prime time 
Yes, it was. Is um, I think I showed this to you, Triv, back like a, a yep. like a month or two ago. But you did. I was telling uh, Triv when I uh, they and the IMAX when it was starting to become a thing. Um, they did a um, uh, it was like a I think it was like about paradoxes and time travel and something like that. It was anyways. It was like a forty minute short, and they showed this the segment of the of the Treehouse of Horror, and it was pretty awesome to see an IMAX. It was pretty funny actually. But I have um, seen an IMAX. It it was tremendous. I cannot remember exactly what the program was, but that's the highlight of it for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was so cool. It really was because uh, you know I'm a huge Twilight Zone fan, but. The the episode is of course uh, season three episode twenty six which is called Little Girl Little Girl Lost uh, directed by Paul Stewart uh, written by or based on a short story by Richard Matheson uh, stars Sarah Marshall Robert Sampson Charles Aidman uh, production code forty eight twenty eight premiered March sixteenth nineteen sixty two so at this point this you know we talked about especially Jacob you know you alluded to this too uh, the Twilight Zone <laughs> has a habit. <laughs> Yeah, trust me. What did yeah. I do now? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, the Twilight Zone has a habit of sometimes taking too long to get going. And uh, you've definitely spotted this before. And um, mm -hmm. Ryan, I don't know how you feel about this either. But this episode doesn't really take that long to get going. It literally goes into the, the little girl uh, having issues and crying and asking for her mom. And I, I kind of wonder what you guys think about that. Because like I said, we've seen episodes before where this segment wouldn't happen to like halfway through the episode. So uh, like, Ryan, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I love that. It's basically the cold open solves the title. By the time you actually see the title on screen, the little girl is already lost. And it is yeah. a remarkable amount of streamlining that, that cannot happen sometimes. And, and when you guys get to season four, you'll see that that happens a lot, considering that they're <laughs> hour-long episodes. And nobody yeah. involved wanted to make hour-long episodes. But yeah, this is, this so is cutting it right. This is right up to the wire. This is This is remarkably straightforward for a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah, it's 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 kind of nice actually because like I said, it's when you, when you have only like twenty four minutes and you have to get to your point pretty quickly. It's nice to see that they're not, uh, you know, meandering. I guess is the easiest way to put it. You see, like in the I don't know showdown with Rance McGrew and stuff like that, or one more Paul Bear. It just I don't know. I, like, what do you guys? How you guys feel about that? Because I know Jacob, you, like I said, you have alluded to in the past, and you're correct uh, that these episodes tend to kind of take forever to get going sometimes. Well, not forever, but uh, a long part of their runtime. Yeah, some of them like kind of draw on a little bit. It's kind of like, you know, the beginning was kind of slow and then it picked up after the act break. But this one just jumped, you know, as right out the gate. Mommy, help me. <laughs> help me, help me. And uh, as like like Ryan said, you kind of know that the, the title is explained right there in the very beginning. I did like that. Uh, this one didn't really, it did not seem like, you know, 24 minutes is not a long time, but it didn't seem like 24 minutes. Some of them drag by sometimes. This one did not. It was it was very snappy, especially there in the beginning. It just jumped right into it, and it had you intrigued the whole time, as to, or me intrigued the whole time as to, like, what was going on, where was, you know, the kid. And I thought the I liked how the parents reacted, like the dad when he went in there. It wasn't quite as theatrical as sometimes you get in some of these older shows because, you know, a lot of these actors came from the theater, so they were very theatrical in their acting. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it just seemed kind of, he was like, where, where, where the hell are you? What are, what are you, where are you at? Did you fall out of bed? What's going on? <laughs> and he's like the, laughing about it, like, well, where are you at? And then like, it kind of sets in that huh, something's going on here. And so, yeah. yeah the tallest, that. uh, tallest bed I've ever seen for a kid. I don't, oh I don't know. You, I don't know. Full six <laughs> feet underneath. off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> the kid needs to jump on the bed and she falls off and like breaks her hip or something like that. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, man. they had to be able to move it with two people. So they're like, okay, we're going to make this the most unlikely bed possible. Right. And <laughs> I was laughing because like they're, they're constantly like just under the bed, just like sweeping it like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like they it's keep going. Like, from... yeah, exactly. It's just even through the uh, like small act break they have before Rod Sterling appears. Yeah, it's uh, he's still checking under the bed, like he's gonna find that kid. And, and I don't what know, kid's um, room is this where there's not one single toy under that bed? <laughs> it ain't none of my kids, <laughs> you've been throwing them through the wall. True, yeah. very, very true. There, there you go, it could be that they're off in the, the fourth dimension or fifth dimension, <laughs> right? Um, actually, another thing I don't know, Ryan, if you knew this or not, but uh, Paul Stewart was actually good friends with Orson Welles, and he is it's actually the Citizen narrator. Kane. Oh, was he? 
Yeah, he's oh, in I, Citizen I, Kane. He's the he's the butler. He's Charles oh, Kane's butler. Oh, that's right. Because he was the announcer for War of the Worlds, I think, if I read that right. Oh, he was part of the Mercury um players. Yeah, he was apparently good friends. Yeah, he's uh he directed and he was good friends with Orson Welles, which yeah, he was a Mercury Theater direct uh producer, rehearsal director, Cavalcade nice. of America. Um uh, yes, yeah, Citizen Kane, like you said. I didn't even see that. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, he had a pretty story career and he only directed a little bit, but um I just say this is his only Twilight Zone episode. And I safe to say it was a it was a pretty good banger of an episode for something that could have been really cheesy. It, you know, obviously uh, inspired a lot of stuff later on. But with that said, it's the episode doesn't like I say it gets going. It's quick. It moves pretty fast. And uh, like, you know, Ron Sterling, he just comes in quickly. Like it, it just it's one of those snappy episodes that just moves and moves and moves. And, you know, I was I usually wait for like 45 minutes to an hour before I get to the opening narration because I forget about it. But <laughs> uh, it happens so quickly. What's that? I love his reveal. A lot of oh, that was yeah, so, yeah. Good. so many of them. It is clear that his part was filmed another time. Like they'll do a whip cut or or a, yeah. some some like cut or something like that. And there's a cut, but the one of the players from the actual episode. If you if you notice, a lot of the times you can see where they cut it, and the actual performers, the actors, aren't in the room with Rod Serling when he does this. This one, he absolutely. I mean, unless they covered it up real damn good, he was in the room with them. Like when, because it shows him, and then it like pans away from him under the bed. And back then, I don't see how they could have cut that to to make it look as seamless as it did. Without yeah, he was definitely in the room. Yeah, yeah. they were all there. Yeah, uh, that was yeah. it. Was a really neat one. You go over to these feet, and I was like, "What? Oh, that's Rod's feet." <laughs> oh my <laughs> god, up with his it's Rod Sterling. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> what's probably really funny is like they're uh, they're looking up like, "Where did you come from, Rod? Like you're you're either behind a tree or you're." You he know, came from whip the panning portal to... in the wall. This yeah, is my exactly. daughter's room. Why are you smoking in it? Come on, dude. <laughs> oh my god, I, I have I have thoughts on. Uh, it's a later point, but we will get to that when we get to that. So yeah, uh, but yeah, Jacob, go ahead and uh, hit us up with the uh, opening narration. Oh, of course, of course. Missing one frightened little girl. Name: Bettina Miller. Description: Six years of age. Average height and build. Light brown hair quite pretty. Last seen being tucked in bed by her mother a few hours ago. Last heard, hey, there's the rub. As Hamlet put it, for Bettina Miller can't be heard quite clearly, despite, can be heard quite clearly, despite the rather curious fact that she can't be seen at all. Present location, let's say for the moment, in the Twilight Zone. So the thing that I love about this prologue is it's almost like a police report. Like it kind of lists all of the facts and and like like a missing child type report. I think that's so cool. Or no, More no, missing no, persons no. reports could include the the line "quite pretty." Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <That's... laughs> or Hamlet. Um... I I, I'm hear... typing up. This guy's six feet, and he was wearing dark slacks at the time. Was he kind of hot? Yeah, he was kind of hot. Kind of handsome. That's all we need to see on the back of the milk carton. <laughs> the very bottom uh, ah, missing <laughs> fuckable yeah. instead of their picture being uh, like some like and just be like <laughs> <laughs> actually i i gotta ask you this ryan and i don't know if this is something you notice um i'm pretty you know richard matheson is a, a very well-known very respected writer in his own right and something i've noticed about uh richard matheson and his like all his stories is they deal they deal with some kind of fear, some kind of loss, some kind of loneliness, some kind of um, object that is constantly just like putting him at like you know the worst possible situation. And, you know, you see that with the I Am Legend, you see that with last uh, the Last Man on Earth or Mega Man, whatever you want to call it. Duel. You see that with like yeah, Duel, Duel. yeah, Duel. Uh, really? You see that with you know um, the other episodes that he's written for the Twilight Zone, uh, Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet. Like, what do you think about that? Like, you know, you get he brings in people like uh, Richard Matheson. He brings in people like uh, Charles Beaumont. He, of course, he writes a lot of the stuff. He did Stir of Echoes, Stir of Echoes, What Dreams May Come, stuff like that. And how do you feel about uh, Richard Matheson, like doing his stories and like how they relate in kind of the human psychology and stuff like that, especially with a story like this and like working with like uh, Roger Corman, all that good stuff. Well, I love Matheson. He is the master of the great idea. He knew how to seize upon something in his life and realize how to make that thing relatable, despite the fact that it's through like a gossamer of science fiction. 
like my favorite science fiction movie of all time is The Incredible Shrinking Man, which he wrote, I believe that's 1955. So that's two years after this short story was published. Yeah. And it was a simple thing. Like he was watching a movie with Cary Grant and Cary Grant was putting a hat on. And all of a sudden the hat was too big for his head. And immediately he's like, aha, I have an idea. A guy is shrinking. And it's like, I don't know how you got from point A to point B, uh, Richard, but God bless you, because my God, I could never do that. <laughs> oh, well, that I mean, a fantastic like, movie, too. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, it's great because, like, you look at stuff like What Dreams May Come, you look at stuff like Stir of Echoes. There, Jaws There 3D. is like a... What's that? <laughs> Jaws 3D. He <laughs> was a writer yes, on that. Nobody's what? perfect, I know, I know. man. That's... Nobody's perfect. Hey, there's nothing wrong with Jaws 3D. The only problem was, you know, when when Jaws was coming <laughs> towards the out. underwater thing. Nothing the only problem was when they made a movie and they Jaws called 3D. it Jaws 3D. That's the only problem with Jaws <laughs> well, 3D. That, that and, you know, the Jaws fact 3D that is Jaws... the only thing wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and the fact that you've got the Jaws, like, coming towards, like, the underwater base thing, and he looks like a loaf of bread just, like, moving along. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I can chroma key better than the people that made that yeah. movie. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, but that. like, he, I think, I think what's great also is that he worked with, um, of course, Roger Corman and like House of the Usher and um, Hitting the Pendulum and some other Almost. stuff that he's worked on. Yeah, um, the, the, the post cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's pretty crazy. Like, I know that, you know, I, I, I harp on Charles Bowman a lot. And just for the simple fact, I think some of his stories are, a little rough around the edges but i never i've looked through richard matheson's stories uh just in the twilight zone alone and there are no like bad episodes that he really wrote i mean i'm sure there's ones that are like lesser than others but it just it's amazing to watch a guy just so talented and so richard well Matheson's well written problem with these things his stories are actually good it's what people do with his stories is where except jaws 3d <laughs> Again, and, no problems with Jaws 3. And he has good genetics because his son, Chris Matheson, a co-writer of the Bill and Ted movies, and yep. uh, I believe uh, 3 O'Clock High. Yeah, I mean, yep. the, I think he, uh, the legacy the, is, uh... is alive in his son. I could say that much. He's not as good as his dad, but the legacy is alive. I mean, he did Bill and Ted, so... <laughs> I think he uh, may be yeah. maybe a little better in some regards. <laughs> he wrote the go- yeah, he wrote a goofy movie. Oh, that's right. Right. Like, like, a, like I was saying, better than his dad. <laughs> exactly <laughs> what I was saying. Yep, yep. Excellent. Um, <sighs> things are amiss. Uh, things are afoot at the Circle K. Oh, yes. That's what they. That's what they said when they were drawing the little dis, the, the little display thing on the wall. They were like, "Hey, it's a Circle K <laughs> station." Um, <laughs> But no, like like I said, it, it's a really interesting thing to see when it comes to like Richard Matheson. But this episode, it's remarkable in the simple fact that it just it's very simple. It's not it, it tries to be smart, but it doesn't try to dumb you down or try it doesn't try to make you feel dumb for watching it. And I, I kind of love that the Jeff is it Jeff? Is it what is that what his name is? Or is it no Bill? Jeff is the yes. eye behind yeah, exactly. Oh no! I th- I kind of I kept thinking they called him so they called him Jeff, but it was Bill. Uh, they called Bill over after they spent oh, like eight hours underneath <laughs> the bed trying to find this kid, right. and then he's like, "I gotta let the stupid dog in," and the dog just runs into the wall because you know dogs are you know running into anything that'll get him into trouble. Dog. And <laughs> <laughs> we're like, "We hate this dog," but he just runs in and like, I mean, okay, like save a- save our kid. Two foot section here that this dog. Uh, honestly, if you look at like when we get to the point where they map it out. And they have it like drawn on the wall. There's actually a lip there, so the dog should have kind of like tripped into the hole. <laughs> yeah, because they had like little sausage especially... legs, you know. So. <laughs> but they call Bill over, and Bill is a uh, is a physicist, right? Which yep. it's it's a weird kind of sub because it's like it's supernatural in its own right. But they they just know a guy named Bill who's a physicist, and it is a little weird to be fairly honest. I don't know what you think about this, uh, Ryan. Like how you feel about the fact that they just have a friend that's a physicist that is able to within five seconds ex- kind of explain what is going on. And uh, like I said, I know this is one of your favorite episodes, but. Is that weird to you at all, or how do you feel? How do you feel about well, that? No, because I live next strange. door to nuclear scientists, and we talk about stuff all the time. So I don't think it's weird to have such professionals living next door. 
Duh. Oh no no I meant yeah Completely I mean it's true it's just you no know, I know it. <laughs> I live next door um, to a gynecologist and we talk about this. I mean I live next to That's next door to time. a graveyard for like twenty years so <laughs> it's why I'm weird and crazy and spooky. No I'm just kidding. No no um but yeah it's it, it's just it feels like it it's not like the worst thing in the world, but it is a little strange that the one guy that can kind of explain everything just happens to be like a good friend of theirs. And it's not like the worst thing in the world. Cause we have seen 10 times worse in the twilight zone. I was just curious what, like what you guys think about that. What you think about that, Ryan, just having this guy that's able to, you know, do the, the Beetlejuice thing and mark on the wall and, you know, open up the door and see, you know, a football team has been dead in a like plane crash or something like that. <laughs> well, crash. I, I personally like it. I mean, it is definitely a convenience. It's one of those things where if you actually sit down and think about it, like, well, can, wow, I hope if anybody has anybody falling into the fourth dimension, we would be living next to a physicist. Right. But <laughs> it is the fact that Richard Matheson is just saying, fuck it, who cares? He's a physicist. He lives next door. Let's move on, move on. Let's get to the point where they go into the fourth dimension. And I appreciate that about it, because if this was the fourth season, this uh-huh. guy would arrive at minute 35. <laughs> and it would be intolerable <laughs> right yeah um actually uh, let me ask you about that the fourth dimension isn't that usually like I- i'm not uh, like so smart about this kind of stuff but isn't the fourth dimension dealing with time travel or is it dealing with something because i i don't know offhand i always thought it was like a time travel kind of like i believe you know... that it just it operates uh, operates outside of time and space but i don't know if it's necessarily time travel i think it's just anything that's beyond our physical plane of existence Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that makes sense. Is I guess I, I'm I'm thinking about like back to the future. I think he's like, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. You're like, oh yeah, that's a problem. I think I think like that too, but it's, it's <laughs> interesting because in, you know, Jacob and Trevor, what you guys think about this, it's, they're able to explain that, it, that we live in this third dimension, that we are one step below the fourth dimension. And he goes into like some details that kind of aren't surface level details. I mean, we're not, you know, what's her face from mirror image where she's like a rocket scientist or whatever here. The guy is able to give us just enough information for like a three or four minute speech. And like, what do you guys think about that kind of stuff too? Cause it's, it's really interesting. It doesn't like, hey. you know, it nee. doesn't like, you know. Nee. Nee. yes. <laughs> well, do you know why? They live next door to a physicist and he's able to explain this so quickly. This is a dad joke. They have 24 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, if you're wondering there, if you're listening to this, Jacob just put a 24. I thought you were doing like 24 from like the Kiefer Sutherland That's show. Awesome. <laughs> that picture was too small to take up the whole pic- the whole uh, screen. <laughs> <laughs> Like oh this my one. god <laughs> terrible oh my god no i mean in all honesty like like they they do you know and they do a, a pretty decent job of just giving you enough information where it doesn't make it feel make you feel stupid for what exactly is going on because once again we'd have to spend six hours just learning about the fourth dimension in its own right but here they they're able to kind of you know break it break it down and the little girl you know her crying and the dog barking and Somehow they're near they're the, back to uh, the future. Did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They they don't give fine. you they, they have this thing that is like really high level that would like you said take hours and hours to explain like time travel with a fucking yeah. car, and instead of explaining to you exactly how it works, they just give you the basics. Hey, this car, would you get it to 80, 88, 86, 88, 88, yeah. 88 miles an hour? 88, yeah. Get it to eighty eight miles an hour. You go and backwards and forwards in time. Bam, that's it. I mean, that's all we need to know. We don't need to know how that works. Just like here, we don't need to necessarily know how it works. It just can. And that's actually part of the mystique is because they do say, we don't totally know why this works, how it works. We, when we get to the end, you know, they talk more about that. It's, But it does. It yeah, happens. Absolutely so. I did love, and I while he was explaining it and kind of drawing on the wall, I had to laugh. It felt like the most Twilight, like, you know, you think stereotypical Twilight Zone explanations it felt like the most Twilight Zone explanation of the fourth dimension. The way, like the, the way he paused at various points, the tone of his speech, the way it was edited, it felt like, like, like the most, like if you took, if you typed in Twilight Zone, that part would come up. I feel like. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> you know what I think would happen. I think if a uh, little girl had gone to the fifth dimension, she would have seen a weird-looking guy on a chair smoking Chesterfield cigarettes, talking to the camera. <laughs> 
And she's like, like, um, <laughs> I need to go one dimension down. And he's like, yeah, take the stairs to the left, follow the exit sign, you know, straight into the straight towards Jeff, the eyeball, that type of thing. But I, I do um, have a, I do have a general yeah. question and I know in the mantra of MSC 3k repeat to yourself. It's just a show. You should really just relax, but they go into the bedroom. They don't see their daughter. They're like, Oh shit. She's somewhere else. They don't search the house like at all like they they just like oh she's not in the bedroom but they don't like look in the closet of the bedroom they don't look in the hallway or anything like that well, they hear her in there that is true that in is the room true. like I, I think they're using like auditory senses they like hear her like she's right here or here but yeah you'd think they would look somewhere else and be like maybe she's throwing her voice or something she learned a new talent i don't know <laughs> yeah, she's in the spherical cue or spherical uh ball from uh what's that what's that movie with the uh sphere oh, God, what is it yeah. No, no, not Sphere. The um, the movie with there was like a it's like a horror series, horror franchise. Uh, uh, that one, Phantasm. Phantasm. Yeah, thank Phantasm. you. With the, the death <laughs> we need to have you on more, Ryan, because you actually get the references. It takes me forever to what explain refer- them. But... How would we get that reference? The sphere, the little <laughs> ball sphere. sphere right, that but there was has. nobody inside the spheres. Well, there I were. Yeah, they, they put. I just know they... he had spheres. <laughs> they did, didn't they put like brains in them or something at one point? Or oh, you're well, no, know. they <laughs> they to- they took brains out, but oh no, the little um, midget like uh uh Jawa looking things, they were people. Oh were, yeah yeah yeah, you're right, you're right. We're, we're getting way off track here. <laughs> one we real quick to, thing, uh, like, and I know it's a little bit down the way, but I love the fact that they end up finding her inside the liquor cabinet. Like that's where she's like come to rest, like where her voice was coming from. It was the liquor cabinet. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even notice that. <laughs> Or is it yeah, bad? It was, it was a fancy cabinet with like liquor and um glasses on top of it. It was the 60s. It was a cabinet, it was a liquor cabinet. Yes, it was. Absolutely. <laughs> liquor cabinet with a uh record player on top. You know. Oh yeah. I mean the 60s, so, they were class. Let's the dish where you put all the keys for your key party, you know. All that yes. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, man. Um, but yeah, I mean basically when they draw the 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 outline which is very it's actually well recognized as like one of the most famous images from the twilight zone i believe and you know it's fascinating because he likes you know it's 60s special effects but it's pretty i don't know what you guys feel about it him sticking his hand through the wall you can kind of see the edits you can kind of see probably a screen that was kind of put over maybe they were doing it that way but like what do you guys think about like the effect and yeah yeah composite and stuff like that but what do you think about that ryan and guys what do you guys think uh they're like the visual well, it's kind surprisingly of, it's know. not an optical shot it was actually done no. by having the wall be a few feet beyond where the where the rest of the wall was and it created an optical illusion when he puts his hand through it so surprisingly oh, no, that's actually not a special effect huh. yeah because i was gonna say it's a it's a pretty good if it was a visual effect it'd be pretty good but yeah it's a if they angle it properly it does look pretty good it's um i know like they do stuff with, like pepper's ghost which you know, they'll have a piece of glass either off to the bottom or off to the side angle that can go off of like a, a silk screen or something like that. But well, I mean, too, yeah, in the way that it's interpreted, yeah. like trying to like visually explain like to, I mean, because you think your average person watching this, they're going to have some understanding of sci fi. But by and large, like understanding that your kid fell through a wall, how do you visually show that? You know, yeah. and they they did a solid job. Like it's a simple, straightforward metaphor. Oh, it's like walking into fog, or the wall is like not solid. It's interesting because you know, even with a story like this, there it can run short because you know they have to keep the the kid in the you know in the the whatever dimension, the fourth dimension. And they have to keep the story going. So the fact that the I don't know how you guys feel about this either, but the fact that the kid can't find the entrance and like you know what is the implications of like what this dimension or this alternate universe, whatever it means. Like you know you look at something like uh, New Nightmares from you know Freddy and like that altered dimension that peers up and then walks in and how weird and abstract you look at hellraiser 2 same thing with like the 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 um the maze or anything like that like what do you guys think about that this simple fact that like the story could be 10 minutes long and they found a way to keep it going because it once again it could be very dry and boring and they somehow made it work but what do you guys think i think it was successful i mean they didn't they didn't linger on any one thing for too long i mean with any with any show it doesn't matter if it's twilight zone or something else there's probably always those one or two places where you could tighten things up 
but I, I think that they made good use of their time and they didn't, they're like, oh, she moved crap. Like that whole, that whole bit to see, you know, trying to find her and locate. And even the way they were trying to explain the ins and outs of turning over and being in a completely different place as compared to walking several feet. Like they did a good job with that. I'm pretty sure that dimension they went to is the same dimension they went to in Insidious. Oh, the further? <laughs> is that what it is? I don't know. Uh, I think so, yeah. I did keep, I mean, was I the only one who kept thinking that, like, when he was, like, reaching for and all that, like, some other creature or something was going to, like, jump up and, or, like, he was going to suddenly be like, oh, and, like, some monster would be there or something. For this kind I of think a story. you've just written a better version of this episode. Oh my god, <laughs> there were monsters in the fourth dimension? That would be awesome. Well, or some kind of creature there that would have some threat. I mean, yes, there's a threat that your kid's going to be lost there, I guess. That's bad enough, sure. Whatever. But, I mean, <laughs> I think it would have been cool if there was like something in there with her, or at least allude to it to give it a little bit more uh, uh, tension. Um, and maybe that's just a cat one. Or he he reaches his hand in and he pulls something out and it's not his daughter and he's like what a, who the hell are you never mind pushes her back in yeah and reaches back in tries <laughs> to grab another kid. thing wrong one <laughs> no Aren't actually you from uh, next door are you me uh, whatever but... it's a monsters <laughs> monsters Inc situation it just like oh, went to the wrong dimension pulls a yeti out yeah. of there yeah just pulls him back <laughs> well no, you actually... could have even done something like that with like if he's reaching his hand through and then. Maybe from the outside of the screen, you see something else come through. But that I think that would be well, really... You got to be so careful with that, though, because like something that's serious can turn into farce very quickly if you're not careful. That part where it showed his hand and it focused on his hand like close up for a long time and he was reaching out, I kept expecting some like gorilla hand or something to be like... <laughs> like ah! Or something like that. No, I think that would have been cool. No, I, some, like uh, dark no. figure running around in the back or something like that. I wouldn't even need an explanation yeah. as to what it was. That's why um that's why I think Poltergeist does so well is it adds in this art this era of um like like uh like um horror and disturbing nature that this episode doesn't do, but it does it really well in the simple fact that like you know this girl in this in poltergeist is in trouble and it gives you kind of like the nature of that whole situation. And here the girl's just as it says, the title, you know, says she's lost. And I, I just found it fascinating that she's, as we'll see, she, she's lost in this place that, you know, where it, like, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like she can even see in front of her. And I don't know how you guys feel about that, but it's just a really fascinating thing where, you know, she is just like scared and she's just like in this like situation and, is she wandering down all those rooms with doors and like I, I don't know. It's it's really a really fascinating thing and kind of you know how do you how do you deal with a situation like that? I mean I know it's the Twilight Zone and it's a you know work of fiction, but it, like I said, it's it's a metaphor for losing a kid and how terrifying that it can be. And I don't know. I don't know what you guys think about that. It's it's existential panic. Like if we were yeah. in an alternate dimension, I would imagine it would be as uh, cohesive. And as sensical as her adventure is, which is to say, not at all. Like our, right. it's kind of like when you see Cthulhu and it just blows your brain and it just explodes because you can't handle that knowledge. Like that's yeah. what I imagine going into the fourth dimension would be like. You're just your brain just done. So yeah, never like with a woman, she just you know, <laughs> blows come off. Her mind explodes. It's like just can't comprehend. Yeah. It's like when you smoke a gigantic amount of weed and you feel like you're two different people and you have no concept of what's going on. Personal um, experience there, Nick? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I, can't, I can't explain. No, but I, it's... um. You know, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Trev. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and, and it's... Uh, there's so much that you could... I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of things that could be pulled from this. And I know that we have already talked about with... um. Oh, what's the one where machines come to life? Um, a thing about uh, machines yeah a thing about machines no, um like, yeah that too <laughs> but like when the, the car was out running around and that was kind of a basis for christine i feel like the, that that stephen king had the same thing with this one he did a, a book or a book called from a buick eight and it's essentially like people fall into the trunk of this car and they end up in this just crazy landscape and like well i mean it, that's a that's a dark tower too you have a kid who lives oh in true yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it, all his. Hey, a lot of his books deal with like people 
being stuck in situations where you know it's very different and weird and is you know unlike anything they've ever experienced um but it's, i just uh, yeah I, I i got the distinct feeling for that book specifically i and obviously there's a lot more to pull from it so yeah yeah it's anyway. um it really it really is a like a it's a creepy episode in the simple fact that it just they can't figure out where this girl <laughs> where this girl is like they can't figure they're searching high and low you know the the it just like the be- I think one of my favorite parts of this episode is like when the mother Ruth goes into her room and there's just a picture of her girl on on the you know on the desk the whatever art um dresser. what is that thing dresser thank you and she's like searching under the bed it just that one picture like instills the simple fact of just how crazy and strange and intense the situation is and like you see this little girl is very innocent and she's stuck in this place that is never fully explained on how it even happens and they will never explain it because it's up to kind of your imagination to like why did this dimension pop up out of nowhere why is it at this house you know is there like skeletons underneath the house i mean it just you never know what's going on but i don't I know like that it wasn't that supernatural yeah it never presented it as supernatural and i like that that it presented it yeah. as just it's science it's just not science you understand yet yeah it's like frequency the movie frequency a little bit yeah. where there's no real explanation outside of just a you know sky whatever the roar borealis well, or whatever yeah. it is but it makes sense you just can't make sense of it exactly yeah. you don't understand well, and- it not that it's supernatural because i feel like if this was made nowadays it would be some like it would be it'd be insidious it'd be some demon dimension or something like that and you know True. i mean yeah i mean in the um tree house of horror it's homer being stuck in a place that is nothing but math equations in <laughs> fish and eventually erotic cakes and stuff like that when he goes to the real Ooh, world and there's no explanation cakes. for it it's just yeah so well and um, too can you imagine like and and uh, you kind of touched on this too but like you can do nothing like to be a parent in yeah. that situation and you know, you try to protect them from, you know, predators and, and bullies and all of the things of life. And yet you run up against this random like hole in space that falls, you know, into your kid's bedroom and sucks them up or doesn't suck them up. But, you know, kid falls into it at like a random hour of the yeah. night. <laughs> you think uh, that's actually let me ask you guys this question. I'll ask you, Ryan, as well. Like how like this this is one of the things that kind of makes this episode really interesting is the little girl is already stuck in this dimension when the story starts did you have, do you like is, do you have any inkling like maybe what exactly she was doing did she fall in did she have like a nightmare did she have a dream about it like if you guys were to create the beginning of the story about how she got sucked into this, this situation like where would you go with it like it's it's really interesting that they never fully explain how she even got there in the first place absolutely believable Kids do weird ass shit when you put them to bed and leave them alone. You think there was like a you know how many times I found my three year old under her bed for no apparent reason? I watch on the monitor and she's just like, I'm like, where is she at? And then I just see like a head or a leg poke out from under her bed. I'm like, what the what what the fuck is she doing? (laughs) That's what they do. She was under there fucking around and then just like, oops, fell off into a wall hole, (laughs) Twilight Zone glory hole. Oh God! <laughs> or it turned into like little monsters where she just got she just kind of fell into the bed and yeah. rolled into the. Howie Mandel came through and said, "Hey, little girl, come with me." Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, but like Ryan, do you have any ideas like what you would think it could be? Or I just uh, I don't think that I'm smart enough to improve upon Richard Matheson, so I oh. would never deign myself to be uh, clever enough to think of how exactly the girl fell through the wall. No, but uh basically it all leads to the little girl is being dragged by the dog because the dog you know its instincts it knows i don't know it's it's really weird it's never fully explained but the dog can kind of they the you know said grab the girl it's like somewhere to like the the morton salt thing or the the was it the uh picture of the kid with the lotion oh the yeah lotion. the uh copper, copper tone. tone yeah copper yeah. Tone. yeah yeah they, yes thank you thank you this leads to uh chris basically kind of falling stumbling whatever you want to call it into this dimension and it's a really it's one of the most effective things i've seen in the twilight zone on the simple fact that like 
you can tell it's not like the most like complicated shot, but it's also like complicated in its own right. And the simple fact that like it almost, I, I don't know if it's the lens they're using. I don't know if it's like they're up against like um, uh, a mirror ball, like they would like do for lighting effects, like to figure out where the lighting, what the lighting needs to be against the screen. Like, what do you guys think about that? What do you what do you think about the nature of how it's presented? It's very like um, throws you off. It makes you feel like very uncomfortable. You're never kind of fully on the ground. You're kind of constantly spinning. It does like all the tricks that the '60s era can do to make to kind of throw you off on your um, uh, whatever that's called. Uh, but throwing like Ryan, balance. what do you think? Thank you. Throwing off balance. Thank you. But like Ryan, what do you think about that? Like the nature of like how this fourth dimension is kind of portrayed in this episode. I I love it. I love the fact that it's all diffused lenses and fog filters and just like really rudimentary stuff, but completely works. And what I love most about it is that it's one of the few, if not the only Twilight Zone episode to actually see the fourth dimension visualized. Because usually it's yeah. just a metaphor. You you right. do something, it activates the Twilight Zone, you go into it, then you get out of it. But you never actually get to see anybody step into that dimension. It's always Rod yeah. Serling telling you that's what they're doing. But here you actually get to see it visualized and it's it's kind of remarkable in that in that way. Yeah, it's um it's nice because they probably didn't build like a very big set. Like you can tell that they probably use the same doors and same wall for most of it. And like the the nature of like, there's no real kind of, even though it's kind of supposed to be like their house in a different dimension, because, you know, she's over here, she's over here. I just, I kind of love the simple fact that it's like a really kind of off kilter thing with, like you said, with the lenses and how the fog and you're never really sure what exactly is going on and where he's at. And it's like, um, I keep going back to Beetlejuice, but it's like when, um, uh alec baldwin character or the gina davis one of the two jumps like falls out the door and she lands like in the middle of whatever desert situation she's in and then she cops she pops up and she's like three hours ahead you know stuff like that it's a it's a really cool effect to like kind of distort your reality in a lot of ways but what do you guys think oh it's it's very well done i mean for the time especially i mean between the way it's edited the way that it's shot it could have come off really cheesy but it keeps you off kilter enough where you don't, even when you notice, you don't notice. I was of two minds. I like that it's so out there and just different from what we're used to. And it does, it keeps you like off balance, if you will, like we've said. So I think that's really good because it's supposed to be an unfathomable dimension where, you know, it doesn't, you, you can't, it, it transcends everything that we, we know here. It's a totally different dimension. But on the flip side of that, I kind of did want to see something, you know, a, 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 a place like where they were walking around. You couldn't really see much because it was like it was like they were filming off of a reflective ball that was reflecting what they were filming and it was all over the place. So, you know, I think it, it worked for this episode. If they were going to do like a longer or like a different story where they explored that a bit more, I don't know if I would be down for exploring that dimension with this effect that they used because it would be kind of difficult to do. Um, but uh, I, I liked it for this, but I would have, if we were going to spend more time in that dimension, I'd like to see something that was a little bit more familiar, even though it's supposed to be unfamiliar. I did have to laugh when, um, when you see Tina being pulled along by the dog, like her nightgown is like attached to the dog's collar. Yeah. Like and do you see her? Combo. Yeah, and you you see her kind of laughing as she's like pulled along by the dog. Um, no, the one thing that I do kind of is interesting, and, and once again, it's not fully explained because you have twenty four minutes. Is the idea of like this physicist is like kind of able to, I don't know if he, you know, in Poltergeist they can kind of feel her presence and so like that, the young girl's presence, and here I think it's kind of the same way, where it's really interesting where they they can feel. I don't know if it's kind of a. Uh, like a, I don't know, like an energy or electricity or something of the girl's like um, being, and it, it can be it can be played off as like really goofy. But I mean, what do you guys think about that as well? Like, you know, the the stuff in the fourth dimension is a really interesting trick that they did for the. But there's like there's tell signs and stuff like that that this girl is her being is still somewhat in this dimension that they're in. I don't Isn't know. it? Uh, don't they hear her breathing? Like when they're able to hear her breathing, that's when they know where she is. 
Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember offhand if that's what it was. It, it's it's just it's really kind of an interesting thing. Um, well, it's more or less like hand. parallel dimensions, isn't it? Like she, wherever she is, there, there's a point in our dimension of reality that coincides to that, even though things are kind of topsy turvy there. So maybe like in that dimension, she's in this spot, but that correlates to this spot that they're. Mm-hmm. I don't, Liquor I don't cabinet know. equals. Bed. Oh God. I unfocused. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this. Look, your cabinet equals bed. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. I don't know. You might want to ask other people that question. You <laughs> might disagree with you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Like, it's almost like he, he's a physicist, but he's also like a, a psychic or whatever. It, it, it's, it's, it's kind of funny in a way, but also kind of. Uh, he has a lot of information about something that's very unknown. Yeah. But yeah. You know, it it happens because <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Um, because anal. Yeah. There that you go. Too. That too. Uh but it leads to she is the young little girl is finally able to come to her dad. She's finally able to with the dog you know, basically pulled back into the dimension. And you would think, well, tw- this episode of the Twilight Zone, and Ryan, you probably agree, like it, that's fine. There needs to be no twist, but the actual there's actually a twist in this episode where we find out that um, Bill actually still had a hold of um, his leg, of uh, Chris's leg, and we find out that the dimension or the the portal was starting to close on him, which we don't see, which we don't realize. Bill says he didn't hear anything or he didn't feel anything, and there's this. Re- really gruesome concept where bill could have been cut in half or i'm sorry chris would have been cut in half if he hadn't gone out just in the nick of time so i mean that's a really interesting twist for an episode that didn't even need a twist and uh i mean what ryan what do you think of that i i i like it even though it causes a continuity error because you can see Uh when he's in the alternate dimension you can see that there is nobody's hands around his legs that he is completely in there by himself but i do like the the moment where he he bangs on the wall to show that it's been completely solidified as one of those kind of like, oh, shit. OK, this yeah. could have gone completely in the opposite direction. And it would have been like maybe if they made Creep Show 5, that would be the <laughs> ending to that segment. But I'm, yeah, I'm glad yeah. it's not the ending of, of a Twilight Zone episode because it's a little yeah. gruesome. But right. it is cool to think about what it would have been like if, the, if that actually was the ending. That would have been pretty cool. Well, that's what I have. That's actually the question I'm going to present then is the idea of like this dimension and its reality and how it works, you know, the fact that he has a hold of, like, as you said, is a continuity area, but is it really a continuity area where is Chris feeling like he's in a dimension and like his whole body there, but he is still at, like halfway through the dimension. So like, what is the implications and the ideas and concepts of what this dimension is doing and how is affecting, you know, because like if you look at like the the way the camera moves and the way that everything works in that dimension, it's constantly affecting your brain. It's constantly affecting your mind. It's constantly affecting like your sense of like real realism and your sense of balance and everything. And I'm kind of wondering if like this dimension just kind of plays with your your reality, like you know going in the further or something like that. Or I I don't know of any other like ideas, but like I mean, what do you think on that nature? Like, is it something that can be probable for this type of situation or i mean i don't know how you feel i think it works within i would i would say that it um i don't know it's i i I didn't have an issue with it just because like like you say like your the your five senses are kind of useless in this domain you know if he were to take one step forward he would have ended up 100 miles from where he was supposed to be so the fact that he didn't feel um jeff holding on to him or the fact that we see him full body, uh, you know, the, the it kind of makes sense within the context of, of the wonkiness of this dimension. We don't know the physics and we don't know the rules of that dimension. So you're kind of at a loss for that. So, you know, as long as you don't gain like, you know, three arms or, you know, two dicks or, you know, 15 eyes. I Wait, think... wait, 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 wait. What's wrong with two dicks? <laughs> Nothing. There's, a, Nothing. there's okay. video of Good, that. It works. I, I am just saying... <laughs> That I feel triggered that you mentioned this in this podcast because, as we all know, I have two, but she's yeah. not cool, not Triv cool. Is, Triv, yeah, two dick phobia. Sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. First, first, Triv doesn't like mayo on her sandwiches and doesn't ah, like butter on her toes. Sake. 
I like butter like, on oh, toast. Oh, there's something wrong with two dicks. Yeah, Jesus. sure, sure. Okay, cool. Yeah. Some people she doesn't like her chocolate trip. or peanut butter. Okay. I do like chocolate and peanut we butter. Le- it's like my favorite. We, we learned a lot from we learned a lot from Triv on the pot on the uh, stream, Jacob. Yeah, yeah. Was, people it was pretty dicks. disturbing. <laughs> Unless they're the ones that so have the two, like the side by side dicks, that's fucking weird. You gotta be the, the <laughs> one on top on the bottom. <laughs> there you go. No, but like, like Ryan, what I was saying, what I was saying about that that concept. I mean, do you still feel the like concept the concept of two still... dicks? I mean, no, yeah. that's not what I'm talking. Shut up. <laughs> no, I, got, I'm talking about hang on, I can look at the videos. Hang on a second. <laughs> no, uh, no, but I, what I was talking about, like with the idea of like messing with your your reality and stuff like that, compared because you were talking about how it was um uh what, what was that word? See, you got me on the think about this damn two dicks thing now. Damn. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's no, no, the um, continuity area. That's what I was thinking of. I was, I was curious of what you thought about maybe that idea. Oh, that uh, that the dimension messes with your mind. Like that's a yeah, that's yeah. Not something I I had actually thought about prior to this discussion. So uh, oh. well done, Triv. Good. I do what I good can. Poll. Good <laughs> Yay. poll. Yay. <laughs> See, Triv works every. Sometimes uh, Triv works in mysterious ways. I try. We don't know about. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> um but yeah that's that's the episode they they save the kid the kid goes off with his mom he almost gets cut in half and uh apparently people have two dicks it's been quite the episode when we talked about I, the twilight i, I just have this terrible image of like they get him out but but uh chris is in two pieces and uh ruth is like you know honey meet your dad and your other dad and like they're both sentient and such and it turns into that some weird be... thing from like society now we thought of a story but, for the new Twilight Zone right. series that is hamster. not the Jordan Peele thing. <laughs> oh man! Uh, so yeah, that is Little Girl Lost. Um, any thoughts on the episode a- uh, after we've finished talking about it? Anything you guys want to talk about, like with the ideas and concepts? Uh, Ryan, I'll let you go first. Like anything else you want to bring up about it? Why you like it? Why you dislike it? All that good stuff. Well, why I dislike it is no, just kidding. I like this episode. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but this is this is one of the the episodes that when I saw it as a kid completely captured my imagination and it was not enough to make me want to go back and watch all the episodes of the Twilight Zone because I was a puss and I was scared of literally everything and I, I figured well if it's sci-fi then it has horror elements and I don't like that dastardly horror stuff but by the time I got to college and started really getting into Rod Serling and the show this was kind of seeing this again was was just that that shot in the arm of like oh yeah this is this is why this show is good and i absolutely adore this episode well i have two things one i love the fact that it's a very small point but i love the fact that ruth has high-heeled slippers and another was a thing <laughs> back in the back in the 50s and 60s but the fact that it's actually in this episode and she's trying to run around in high heel slippers makes me laugh um hey, the other bryce thing I- can do it this woman in the sixties can do it. True, very true. <laughs> um, the other thing I had to laugh about was, and it, it happens after after the whole episode is over, and they've gone and told you what's going to be on for next week, and then Rod Serling does his whole like Chesterfield um advertisement, and just the fact that an advertisement for cigarettes Enza is on the back end of this episode about a little girl. I just I find that so funny. Like the 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 disconnect between the sixties and now is just funny. In that and it's not separate either. It's like no. part of because usually he, those those he pauses for a separate. second and then immediately yeah. moves on to talking about oh they satisfy. It's like wait yeah. what? Uh, huh? Okay, sure. Because they usually they usually have like his little hey this is what's next week and then there'll be like a cut and it'll be like a an, an, a separate advertisement he filmed or something. But no, this one's yeah. like, by the way. If you found this satisfying, know what else? Chesterfields. That's what I want to. <laughs> Or Oasis for the smoothest. Yeah, softest taste. Softest, the softest, yeah. the smoothest. <clears throat> Get it right, man. Yeah, it's smooth. <laughs> um, it's not toilet paper. What What's kind of funny, I don't know if you guys have watched uh, Quiz Show, but th- they did this in the 60s where they had um, the person, the, the talent, just basically in the middle of the show do an ad for, I don't know, uh hoover or oh, cigarettes yeah. or something like that. It, it was pretty crazy it's not like now where you know they actually have marketing companies doing it all you know just like you know 12 minutes of tv commercials it was 
Anyways, pansies the... nowadays can't talk about the cigarettes with kids. <laughs> right. When I was a kid, fucking GoBots had cigarettes. <laughs> so did the Flintstones. Yeah, they did. right. No, um, and this was the first episode on Paramount Plus that actually had that commercial. Well, the rest really? of them never had that commercial. Yeah, yeah, huh. I thought that was kind of interesting. So that is probably because it's built into it like that. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, oh, one other real also... quick, one other real yeah. quick thing. Did you notice on the the I, I think on the intro music too, but on the outro music they used a slightly different track. Oh yeah, it was like house music. Yeah. Like it was like what was used previously, but it just shut up. <laughs> but it was slightly different. Like I went back and listened to the episode previously, like the outro for that, and it was different. Are you talking about like the end credits? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's kind of ironic that another really great episode of the series is um Talking Tina episode. And yeah. it actually is the same it's the same two girls, the voice oh. and the, the young girl. Uh, oh, that's right. Why did they have a vo- a separate voice for the little girl. Some the little girl was stuck woman. in the fourth dimension, and she was scared, and that made her voice turn into a thirty-two year old woman. <laughs> yeah, there's some random woman in the 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 fourth dimension that was like, you know, she's like, I don't so then her yell. parents were like, who the fuck is this person yelling in my house? And where's I mean, my kid? <laughs> I mean, for all we know, the parents were like mad at her when she uh, got back from the fourth dimension, and you know locked her up and her grandmother died and she talked to her on the phone and oh god eventually yeah eventually wow drowned and, oof. yeah wow oof. Oof. oof so anyways with that said anybody else have anything else to say apparently i think triv alluded to this or at least part of it earlier but i, I just read this that the um the story was based on a story that did you did you mention this but it was based on triv uh no i didn't i mean nick said that it was based on a matheson story well the yeah well, his story on... his story is based on a, a true life event where it says uh, matheson wrote a sh- short story based on a real life incident involving his young daughter who fell off her bed while asleep that happens and rolled against a wall despite hearing her daughter's cries for help matheson's wife was intently unable to locate her daughter that's there creepy you dumbass <laughs> <laughs> How big is this fucking bed? I mean, how many places could the kid be? Massive. It's massive. There's too many uh, there... like bed skirts. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a movie where like it was like I don't know if it was one of spoof uh, spoof movies or whatever, but like there was like six corners of the bed underneath. They're like looking at one side of the bed, then they look at another, and like six more times they look at the different post, and they come back, and there's the creatures there. <laughs> That's <funny>. awesome. Um. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, with that said, that is the episode, and uh, we'll do the closing narration. Jacob? Oh, yeah. I have, I totally have that ready. Hang on. Um, <laughs> the other half where? The fourth dimension. The fifth? Perhaps. They never found the answer, despite a battery of research. Physicists equipped with every device known to man. Electronic and otherwise. No result was ever achieved. Except perhaps... A little more respect for the uncertainty about the mechanisms of the Twilight Zone. Yeah, <laughs> made wow, it sexy. Wow. Why did you make it sexy? Ooh, <laughs> wow, wow. always. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. All right, all right. Um, so yeah, that's a little girl lost, season three, episode twenty-six. And uh, let's do it. Let's get Woo-hoo. into the closing narr- or closing. Do it. Do it. I just let's get into it. the. I'm not doing it again. Oh, I wow. sent you. I, so let's do it. Let's get into the last portion of this uh, that's episode a, that's a big of tweet. our episode. <laughs> uh, big DM. Right. Uh, which, of course, is the Twilight Zone ranking list, the greatest ranking list, because we love ranking so lists. Who doesn't like ranking lists? You know, we love ranking lists and Ross certainly loves ranking lists. Do we, do we like ranking, ranking lists? List. I, I didn't know. Uh, okay. So this list is long. That's what she said. Girthy. And uh, is this a tw- is this a top twenty episode? Yes or no? Yes, I would say. Um... <laughs> <laughs> now, how far up the list are we going to go on this? I know, I know, Ryan, you said it would be top ten, but do you guys think it's a top ten episode, or do you think it's between ten and twenty? Like, where do you guys see? Yeah, uh, I don't do how... good with that. You just need to give me a starting point, and then I can debate it. I did. Me. I give you twenty. Oh come on. So <laughs> it's better than the silence. Um, is it, it kinda, better than? 
God. For, for me, it, it kind of has a similar vibe. So I don't know why. It kind of feels like a similar vibe to five characters in search of an exit, just because they're dealing with a thing that is so outside the realm of their knowledge. So I would say start there. Um, hmm. I mean, five characters is a good one. Mm-hmm. But I really liked this episode. I did. And like, there's not even anything like monumental that happens in this episode, like with five characters and in search of an exit. But it's just, this is just a really well put together, a really well done episode, I thought. Hmm. Uh, would this be better? What do you than, think, like, Ryan, real... being our guest? I think this is better than Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up, but uh, I'm biased. Uh, it's def- It's not as good as It's a Good Life. So I'm already confused here between 12 and 14. Yeah, yeah that's we'll, about, we'll that's do about that sounds about right. Yeah, it sounds about right. <laughs> Everyone that comes on, they're like, oh, how did Our you do this? Our list only exists in the fourth dimension, so it's <laughs> kind of hard to disseminate and understand. The things that drive the decisions from week to week change. <laughs> kind of. I mean, they, they stay consistent, but yeah, anyway. Every time we do this, one of us, usually me, is like, "How? Why is that one so high? Why is that one there? Why is this above that?" <laughs> Would you put this like above Purple Testament? I think this I one has. The a... Question is: Have you seen all of these in the top twenty? Oh, that's for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've seen all the episodes, but no, okay. recently, not enough to 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 be uh, on top with this. My God, you guys are stressing me out here. <laughs> Oh my god! Sorry, it's like a no Sophie's way. Choice thing. This is crazy. I can't believe I'm this. I'm, I'm sweating. I'm actually physically sweating. Oh god! This is this it's... is uh, this is how we are every week. <laughs> <laughs> Except when we get to Trouble Templeton. Like, yeah, yeah that, that episode sucks. And sixteen millimeter shrine, but we don't talk about that. Uh, you, I don't talk about that. That is true. You don't. Um, I mean, well, is this? Is this an episode that is better than like Walking Distance, or is it worse than Walking Distance? Is it better than Purple Testament? Is it See, than I, Shadow I, Play? I'm I'm kind of in a weird place because, and I know we run into this a lot, but I think this is better than a stop at Willoughby, but I don't think it's better than Purple Testament or Shadow Play, which is a whole lot of not helpful. Yeah, we're here for a half hour trip. It's all your fault. I know it's, everything's my fault. It's because I don't like Mayo, isn't it? Okay, so if we're, yes. if, we're if we're in that that ten range. I'm gonna so like say, ten to fifteen ish. I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna just start at ten and see where I come up. I really like Purple Testament. Um, I mean, if it were me, I put this between Shadow Play and Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up, but that's just me. Because I, I did Purple I really like this episode. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm just saying that's that's kind of where I would land. I, I'm just asking you guys because I'm curious what you guys. Purple Testament. I think, Sh- I think Sh- Shadow Play is a really interesting, really thought provoking episode. I think Will the Real Martians Please Stand Up is fine. Um, I think it's good. More than has fine. An interesting ending. I think it has an interesting it's ending. <laughs> yeah. It has um, uh, Roddy McDowell in it. I think it's Roddy McDowell. Yeah. yeah. I think that what, what does Purple Testament, what, what ranks it so high for me is it had fantastic performances that you didn't see. And not that the performances in Twilight Zone were bad, they're very of their era. Purple Testaments, and I've said this a hundred times, well, 90 times, I guess. Um, Purple Testaments performances were leaps and bounds just above what the other one, they're so much more sincere and that really pushed that one ahead. Uh, like the actual story of Purple Testament was was good, but it was really the performances. Um, story-wise, and just like what I, I like this one more. Uh, Stop at Willoughby, I Stop at Willoughby was fine, but I don't hold it as high a regard as you guys, so I think this is better than Stop at Willoughby. I think it's better than Walking Distance. Um, I think it's better than Obsolete Man. I don't think it's better than To Serve Man. Right. But just like starting right there where Trip was a second ago and working my way down, I would watch this before any of those. They're all great episodes, but I would work watch it before those. And you get to to Serve Man, you know, that's just uh, such a hell of a iconic episode and then yeah. you got monsters death's head revisited i know you guys i didn't hate it but you guys liked it a lot more than i did shelter was great of course the invaders <laughs> number one um that's where i'm currently sitting so between like seven and uh, so like seven is kind of what you're thinking yeah if you asked me if i was the only person if i was on here by myself 
just playing with my two dicks, I'd be like, hey, yeah, number number seven. <laughs> I could see. I don't necessarily feel see? that. Oh, occasionally. Oh, um, yeah. not when my eyes are closed, but um, <laughs> I think it's definitely better than a stop at Willoughby. I I'm on the fence about if it's better than walking distance, but I I could fall in that seven to nine range. Nick, Ryan. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we gave Ryan on, a on, I'm so sorry, Ryan. <laughs> we love you. You can do this, Ryan. You can do this. I've been podcasting for four years. You can do this. <laughs> I mean, have, like, I've been doing this. I, I've been doing this for four years. I'm so experienced. And then we go on, come on the fifth dimension. It's like all hell breaks loose and everything's out the window at this point. <laughs> He's I'm like, so torn because uh, Monsters is number one for me. So I'm already at a loss here. Yeah, trust me, I'm right there with you because it, it is one of, it is my favorite episode as well. But I had to concede because uh, they really like uh, Eye of the Beholder. <laughs> yeah, he says that. Okay. Yeah. But then, Death's Head revisited, which I think was a good well, episode. Oh, that, that, that took the, me by surprise. I think I was like really affected by that episode. So. I thought not less in like a bad way, but they thought much higher of that episode than I did. I think it would have been a great, it, it would have still been closer to the top, but it's above Monsters are doing Maple Street. I didn't fight for that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fight for that one. <laughs> uh, I'm fine with I'm fine with that because it doesn't really, it's not like the worst. I, I, I'm not going to like die on the hill of being between 10 and 11 or 11 and 12. I think it's perfectly good, right? If it hits the top 10, because it's, it's a pretty remarkable episode. So it is. It's very good. Yeah, and it's so, inspired uh, a lot. Yeah, yeah, and it does a lot for twenty four minutes, which, as we've learned, can be a, a detriment to the Twilight Zone. So yeah, well, and you know, yeah. if you you know, you think about this one and To Serve Man, I mean, both of those have spawned so much stuff. You know, they're yeah. you know something very different for their time and you know sense. While we're thinking about this, just throw something else in that we didn't talk about earlier. Do you think this would have been better served as an hour long episode? No, oh, no. <laughs> no. I don't think anything I don't. in the Twilight Zone. I think it would have ruined yeah. it. Yeah, it would have yeah, spent time trying not. to put in more time in the fourth dimension, or just more drug out time in the beginning, or something like that. But hmm. well, and how many episodes Curious. have we discussed where they they filled the twenty four minute runtime, but they maybe shouldn't have? Like it should have been a fifteen oh, yeah, minute sure. or something. That's happened to yeah. yeah. An adult swim version of the Twilight Zone? Yes, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Robot. Or do like the eighty the eighties <laughs> version did where they had like three episodes per hour or whatever, where each episode was like twenty minutes or something. <clears throat> or is it four? They did like three or four episodes per episode or whatever. But see, but even with that, I feel like and I, I understand that you can't you gotta work within your time limits and like mm. half an hour, an hour is kind of your go to. But yeah, you know, you don't have the time to like absorb what's going on like you're on to the next thing i feel like that kind of did a detrimental thing to the the 80s twilight zone but yeah that's me um so i don't know below walking distance above stop at willoughby i'm good with that yeah i know it's not your (laughs) yeah yeah let's go with it yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah i know that's not your where you would put it right but i'm just curious like does that seem all right that seems I fair. Know. That that uh, considering that this is not my list, that seems no. completely fair. I okay, I mean, it's still seven, yeah, it still makes it I a top ten. Concede. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, you know what? It's under twenty eight. <laughs> All that really matters. <laughs> Her it's chance above, is not twenty nine. Got to yes. figure out a way to push that thing to last place. I don't know how that works. <laughs> you need to take all of season four and put it's, it in the top 30. In all honesty, it doesn't it doesn't deserve anywhere near last place, but it certainly doesn't deserve anywhere near where the fuck it is either. <laughs> Should definitely be on the back well, end. But in the no, fourth it's, dimension, it's in last terrible. place. How's that feel? The thing that irritates me the most about that episode is that it is so high. And I'm like, what were you thinking? You guys like were drunk. I might have been. Probably. Yes. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> see. Uh, they watched so the next week's episode. <laughs> uh so okay. Yeah, it's a good place. Um pretty high spot for that. So it's uh yeah, I think that'll work. Uh so with that said, 
new number nine is Little Girl Lost. Number one is still I the Beholder. Number ninety one is The Trouble with Templeton. Oh, hang on, hang the on, next... hang on, hang on, hang on. Number seventy four is? is a piano number in seventy four. The house. The house. Seventy five people. You gotta remember oh. seventy five. Right, right, right. Seventy five. Uh, you ruined it already. Well, right a now. Piano in the house. The house. Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the next episode is, of course, season three, episode 27, Person or Persons Unknown, uh, directed by John Brom, written by Charles Beaumont, episode, uh, stars Richard Long, Frank Silver, Silvera, Shirley Ballard. Uh, we'll look forward to that. It's the smoothest episode, apparently. Chesterfields, I don't know. It's, it's I, I don't oasis. remember much about oasis it. Oasis is the smoothest taste. Yes. Softest. 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 Taste. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So with that said, uh, we're going to head out for the time being. Ryan, uh, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I know it's pretty crazy. It's uh, very strange when it comes to trying to figure out things in the Twilight Zone, and you're very knowledgeable of it, so I do appreciate you coming on, and uh, it's been fun. We'll hopefully have you on again at some point. So uh, with that said, uh, where do you have your content located at? Uh, you can find One Track Mind wherever you listen to podcasts, and you can find me on X. I'm never going to get around saying that <laughs> at one track mind pod. And I'm on Instagram at one. That is the numeral one track mind podcast. I did not get to choose that name. They gave it to me. So don't be mad at me about it. I'm also <laughs> on uh, Patreon at patreon.com slash one track mind podcast. He also Excellent. does. He's also a reoccurring guy on um, reels of justice, which is a fantastically fun uh courtroom based uh movie podcast both are well worth your time but you're biased because you were on twice <sighs> fine <laughs> you've been on more times than i have so screw well, you yeah it's my podcast I well yeah have to be. i know but you're still making points and so i'm making points and this is why i'm not very good at it <laughs> hey i will say you got robbed on the first one that that's yeah. That's to be honest. I shouldn't have won that case. You should have won. No, it's all good. I can take a loss. I'm used to it. So yeah. Yeah. Listen to <laughs> anyway. Trip losing at something finally. Gosh. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely look listen to all his content. It's fantastic. Um, I've listened to a few few episodes. It's definitely worth listening to. Uh Triv, Jacob, as always, you guys are awesome. I try Aww. to I try to say that to make you feel better because in the end, uh, you know, I'll make sure you get lost in the fourth dimension, but Jacob, you just don't like pineapple on yeah. pizza. Yes, that's the reason I want to make you guys go away. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, in all honesty, Jacob, you have content. You are in the middle of working yeah. on another series, but you have some great stuff you worked on that have done really well and have been really awesome and informative. Where's that content located? YouTube. Um, you can find me. I have two YouTube channels, one of which is currently Jacob Anders Reviews. Go watch that stuff, but I don't put much on there right now. Maybe I'll come back to it sometime. But I am currently focusing on Retro JKXY, my other YouTube channel. It's a newer YouTube channel. Go subscribe to help that one grow, where I do mostly retro video game documentary series. I have one on the Dreamcast and the N64, and I have another one that I'm working on right now that I'm not prepared to talk about. It'll be out probably in about a month, honestly. Nice. We'll start monthish, beginning to middle of October, I'm looking at. So I have more to talk about there. It's a more... More recent than those two, but not super recent. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, I have uh, that stuff. Go check it out. Nice. And I'm on X, t- Twitter X, 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 Twitter, X, X. <laughs> the Twitters, the Twitter X. I'm over there. Yeah, I don't really do much there. <laughs> I look at like historic vids and funny videos of people getting beat up and post those. So check there that you out. Go. Yay. And Triv, people now know that you hate mayo and butter, oh, God. And chocolate and peanut butter. Uh, oh shut your if, face but you also have content that's awesome you put out you know crazy wild videos about crazy and wild stuff <laughs> when it comes to the very crazy and terrible movies that are all awesome in the same right but where's that Absolutely. content located now you can find me here on youtubes at uh trivial theater um i did blood theater and then i did theater of blood and then coming up i am taking a completely left turn and doing a collab on the teenage mutant Ninja shuttles from the 90s um, so Ooh. definitely check that out. Um, I'm also working on some other stuff coming up for October, which is, you know, spooky month and all that good stuff. I also just uh, finished up, of all things, uh, merch, uh, which is on Etsy uh, under Triv's Place. Uh, it's all mugs right now, but uh, if you'd like to stop by and check that out, please feel free. 
Yeah, definitely. And uh, the link for her channel for her uh, merch will be in the comment or in the description of the below. So Aww, definitely give her digs. stuff a, a big look and sale and all that good stuff. So uh, myself, Movie Emporium, that's where all this video this video content is held. Uh, I posted, you know, a couple of reviews coming up here soon. I've been kind of lacking, but just because I've been sick. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. There you go. Uh, otherwise, we're on audio feeds like Anchor, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and all that good stuff. Uh, but with that said, uh, we're gonna head out. And for myself, Triv, Jacob, and Ryan, uh, we'll see you guys next time on the Twilight Zone. Peace out, motherfucker. <laughs> Four hundred. Let's be more sensitive. Ah! <laughs> I hate. I hate messing with chroma key. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I'm a ghost. I'm a little boy gone. Little boy lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God.